The Sleepers, Chapter 19, Double Homicide Samantha showed up unannounced for our master's thesis defense. Ray and I had dedicated this semester to research and writing. Her arrival marked the recompense for our labors. I had not spoken to Sam in four months. I predicted near silent treatment since our dance in the office, but not utter silence. There were surely ways of discreet communication she might have employed. I had no idea what to expect from this surprise visit. The eyes of forlorn and lovesick graduate students turned awestruck as Samantha entered the room for our defense. Cornell Decembers were too cold for bare legs, so she dressed in tight blue slacks, cut above the ankles to reveal a bit of skin. She evoked feelings of wonder and lust as she strode straight for Ray, ignoring the professors and students crowded around the oval table. I didn't know you were coming, Ray stuttered as she approached. I wanted to surprise you. Don't be nervous. I'm here to support my boyfriend. With that cool confidence, she leaned toward Ray and kissed him. It was a calculated kiss, the very image transmitting rivulets of wonder through the minds of all men present. She dropped her petticoat on his lap as if he were a porter, revealing underneath a thin off-white blouse. The students tried to look away. Most failed. Before Ray could speak too much and spoil her entrance, she settled into a seat next to him and patted his leg. I settled next to Samantha as Ray prepared for his presentation, he being first on the agenda. Thankfully, I had dressed up in a sports coat and tie for my defense and felt prepared, though shocked to see her. Sam, nice of you to join us, I whispered. I expected to be seeing you visit Ray sooner. I hoped to allude to her absolute avoidance and probe her intentions. Pleasure seeing you as well, John, said Samantha, returning the greeting. She still wanted me. Her public recognition of my existence confirmed her passion. To any observer, it appeared a natural greeting. But to me, one whom she ignored when first introduced, it meant everything. She could have dismissed her boyfriend's sleeper. Instead, she coquettishly returned to my smile. Sam continued, I have so wanted to visit Ray this semester, but it has been very difficult to slip away from my school. I would not miss this milestone in his life, though. We'll be spending lots of time together this weekend to make up for time lost. Her words seemed empty and rehearsed. In most respects, they were. The words were clues, cookie crumbs for a clandestine love dance, an unspoken Sherlock puzzle. Sounds scandalous, Miss Carlyle, to spend so much time with each other, I challenged, dropping my own bait. Samantha was a social snob. Casual sex had long become so commonplace that English dropped the familiar adjective, but not for Samantha. She was too proper and too feminine to reduce herself to wanton sexual relations with any suitor. This was her form of propriety and control. I knew she did not and would not have sex with John or me, but the tease was delightful. Oh, I will be staying in my own room at the Baymont Hotel where I'm booked. We're a couple, a proper, dignified couple. So, Sam meant for me to find her. She acknowledged my existence and confirmed her nightly whereabouts. It would be an interminably long thesis defense, both Ray's oration and mine, before nightfall, before I could visit the Baymont. Even then, I would have to wait until Ray's evening concluded. Thankfully, Dr. Santos was still my private sleeper, and I could afford a late night. Standing at the front of the table, Ray started his defense. I daydreamed to pass the monotony until mine commenced. I waited until 10.30 p.m. to visit Sam's hotel. The Baymont was near campus, having replaced several dilapidated structures in town. The Matsons helped fund its construction to provide something elegant enough for sleep-free meetings with Lucius and the recruiting pool. With my thesis finished and approved, there was ample reason to celebrate, but I had spent the evening alone. My parents were too busy to attend, and I hadn't invited them. My research was falling into place. Celebration with Samantha was all I needed. I didn't fear arriving to Sam's room too early. She would never invite Ray up after a date. If something was going to happen between those two, it would be after marriage and the whole world would know. My timing was appropriate, casual, and anticipatory, but not overly eager. I called from the front desk, and she answered with her room number. As I moved down the hotel hall, I imagined a rush of passion when I entered. We hadn't seen each other for months. I expected the yearnings were mutual. I expected the physical relationship would resume full force. She would have changed clothes just to drive me crazy. I entered and confidently approached, ready to resume our lust. Instead, 
I received a barrage of invective. I had wrongly judged the phrase looking down your nose as an exaggeration of haughty disdain, but there she was, two blazing eyes perched contemptuously between an upturned nose. Her blonde hair seemed electrified, ready to jolt anyone dumb enough to get close. Before I could reach her, she started. I misjudged you, John. You are neither Ray's pet nor his equal. You are not his perfect self, a union of heart and brain. You behave as Ray only to ingratiate yourself in his circle. You are a self-inflicted pariah, a sulking, subtle plotter, shrewd, and horrible. She paused momentarily, and I interrupted. What are you talking about, Samantha? We're kindred spirits. What, what, what happened? Her vitriolic reproach shocked me. Where was the homecoming kiss? Had I missed the segue to this madness? Kindred spirits, she flustered. I had believed you and I were alike. I entertained the notion that we were great, that we recognized Ray's potential and might exploit it. But we are nothing alike. I meant to love Ray. Again, I took the opportunity to speak, finding the fighting words easier than humility. You never truly loved Ray. You know me and you love me. Don't interrupt me, John. Her eyes flared again with sharp venom. Fine, she consented. I would learn to love Ray, but you mean to destroy him. You don't just want to use him. You want to own, crush, and ruin him. You have some twisted plot. I will not be a part of it. It was becoming increasingly obvious I was not going to coax her out of this rage. But I had to know why the change. What happened, Sam? Why have you changed? Don't call me Sam. I was there today, John. Were you too busy plotting to notice? Your thesis, she shouted as if reading my ignorance, is an open blueprint for destroying the client. I thought my work was subtle and sufficiently redirecting to conceal my motives. Ray had certainly never suspected foul play in my research, just honest scientific discovery about dream transfer. She was as smart as I imagined. I tried to move in to hold her, but she pushed me away, my back against the door. If it had been open, I would have been gone already. I can read you clearly now. I thought you were just playing a game. Some healthy manipulation like me. I could handle that maneuvering. But combine your distaste for Ray with the power of your research, and you will be deadly. I can only imagine what harm you will cause to that poor, innocent boy. Then join me, Samantha, I blurted, unprepared to enter a partnership. You need us both. I can share you. I have shared everything else in my life with Ray. Let it once be something that matters. I didn't detail my plans. She didn't need to know, and I didn't need to implicate myself through verbal confirmation. But I didn't want to lose her now. We are finished, John, but you won't care. You will progress from concept to plan to action until you have conquered. I will not stay around to watch your demonic crusade, and I most certainly will not be a part of it. Her hand flew up in rage, stopping any rebuttal. I would have coaxed Ray and exercised control if he and I married. But you are beyond heartless. As much as I want that dream of happiness with Ray, I cannot break you two apart. I cannot have him without you, and I would never have you. Not now. I will break his heart, but no one will break yours. I only wish they could. She nearly spat her last words as if cursing at a demon. As her diatribe finished, she pushed me aside, flung open the door, and threw me out, without even a kiss, hug, or goodbye to seal this shocking evening. Just one parting shot while slamming the door. Good luck with Dr. Santos tomorrow. I came home from Sam's room, dejected and ponderous. There were the typical feelings even I could not suppress. Pity from rejection, melancholy over loss, and nostalgia for the summer. But what did she mean about Dr. Santos? Why did I need luck? Only Sam had worked out anything about my plans. He wasn't going to fire me. He couldn't. And he would never believe her, even if she had spilled her wild theories. Her wiles wouldn't work on the wizard. I needed sleep. Yet the risk was sickening. Forget the breakup. I had to reevaluate my strategy. I needed to reconsider my thesis work. Select something more benign or obtuse for the doctoral quest. I couldn't have others supposing as Samantha. And I really needed to practice lying better. Rather than refute her, I had offered her a role as a confidant. How could I be so lovesick to forget all caution? She had rejected me, and I countered with a partnership? If there was going to be a next time, I would need to be more circumspect. I retired to my deck on this late evening and pondered Sam's sheer womanhood. The cold was no worse than most nights that winter, bearable with a good coat or just perfect as a miserable bedmate. 
I had been so close to being with a perfect specimen, a truly rare find. Now I sat with loneliness, my greatest longtime ally, staring at the campus below and the stars above. Women would leave, friends would vanish, mentors would die, but loneliness never leaves. And I never left her. She was my true, constant companion. As I contemplated life from my one deck chair, wondering about the future and whatever awaited with Lucius, a man came into view in the distance. He had the stance of dejection, head down and slow. He came closer to my building, direct on entering after what appeared a long walk. I realized as he passed under one of the street lamps that this morose figure was Ray. Silence and solitude strengthened Ray. His walks alone were pathetic and cathartic. This was not the first time I had watched his pity march. My small deck, barely affixed to the dormitory, gave me room enough to sit, read my assignments from the wizard, and quietly observe pedestrians. If he'd look up, he might wonder why I was awake still, but his nighttime walks were for hanging the head in gloom. Ray had discovered solace and emptiness when we were young. He stole it from me, just like everything else. Whether through observation or dream transference, Ray developed a strange love for loneliness, a passion for quiet walks and moments to cleanse the soul. Nothing was sacred from your employer. I doubted this people-pleasing extrovert learned to cherish alone time as I, but he did practice, especially after breakups. And even though he stole the concept, these moments were strictly his own, sleeper-free and non-obsequious. Friends leave or die, hobbies become pastimes, and good books usually get banned, but solitude never abandons. Seems today we both needed her comfort. I watched him quietly from my perch. He was clearly ending a lonely, self-inflicted pilgrimage through the dark night. You could bless a man with nocturnal strength, but you could not give him light. Draped in misery, Ray's aura telepathically communicated the story of the night. Ray had left the thesis defense to celebrate his success with Samantha. She was a proper lady. She would have indulged him over dinner. Then he would have talked to the future, probably as they went on a walk together near the restaurant. She would then have turned distant and heartless. His pitiful stride said she had ended the relationship. Of course she would have ruined him first. She broke his heart before she even started the tirade on me. Her approach would be softer, but more dissatisfying. Her reason was me, not Ray. But she couldn't say that without revealing too much. Sure, she could say he was spineless and dreamless, an empty man powered by a villain. But there was no need. She would make up a lie. We are too different. Or perhaps, I'm not at the right place in life right now. Some line that would leave a man like Ray pining for ages, always wondering what really happened. Then she would entertain pleas and bargains for a brief moment from Ray, before adding conviction to her lies. She would make it clear they were finished, and then she would disappear forever, returning to the hotel to finish me off last. It was an obscenely typical way to end a relationship with such a fantastic woman, so unlike the many other splashes in Ray's trudge to marriage. Ray came up the stairs, done with his walk. He lived on the floor above mine, separation making a clear statement on status between sleepers and clients. Emptiness trailed Ray into our building. No amount of hate for the system or for my client could make me cheer at his loss. The man deserved pity. In my solitude, I mourned with him and for him. The world outside seemed a little brighter with Samantha's victims, all tucked away indoors. Our building moaned. Chapter 20. Course Correction Ray entered the lab the next morning visibly dejected and crestfallen. Our experimental setups rested on opposite black countertops. The lab was kept clean given the risk of contagion, but dirt spots and cluttered equipment revealed that college students could only sanitize or organize so well. I learned real lab sterilization once employed at Sleep Free. He caught me sitting on a three-legged stool, hands on my head, stressed over the impending conversation with Lucius. My night had been restless, with dreams of Samantha and Lucius and everything terrible. I lifted my head and forced something close to a smile. Ray would never ask about my day when he had his own woe to tell. So in habitual form, I reclined with glazed eyes, nursing my temples. Laboratory goggles made blank stares all the more vacuous. I would never be allowed to express any agony over Samantha's departure. Instead, I would live vicariously through Ray's suffering. I don't know why this always happens to me, began Ray. We had a pleasant, celebratory dinner, no mention of any problems. It was a happy day. I thought she was happy too. It was as I predicted. 
He moved around the workbench so he could better commune with me over the noise of my experiment. Pulling up a screeching stool next to my own, I could hear his deep breathing. His eyes welled with grief. This man trusted me with all emotion and always had. I walked her back to the hotel, hand in hand. I admit I was nervous in her presence, having not seen her since summer, but her collective strength relaxed all fears. She even stroked my ego, letting me know how well my defense had gone. Everything was perfect until I went to kiss her goodnight. She pulled away. He paused with grief on his face and explained. It wasn't disdain, just simple rejection. I have seen her scorn the world, but this was contempt-free. I was not to, prepared to lie, so I kept my mouth shut. She said she's not the one for me. I don't understand how she could change so suddenly. She said I have a path, a destiny, and she can't be a part of it. I tried to renounce my path, but she insisted, said it was too late. She would not and could not join me. There would be no second chance. There was nothing I could do to change her mind. He sighed with troubled breath, taking in the finality of it all. It's over. It's really over. I knew what he could not. Any change for Ray would make little difference if I remained his sleeper. And for someone as amazing as Sam, just one half of the whole would never be enough. With his exasperated pause, I had a chance to leave. I started with an empathic sigh. I'm sorry, Ray. Dr. Santos is expecting me. I excused myself from his miserable soliloquy, choosing a new torture over listening more to Ray. My stomach turned thinking about what Sam had said to my professor. I planned to preempt anything he might share from her and proactively change my research plan, despite a successful master's defense. No matter what, I wouldn't bring up Sam. Dr. Santos had never questioned my research motives, but if my work was so transparent to her, I couldn't pursue it further. The risk was too great. Sooner or later, someone would expose my plan and destroy my purpose. For the sake of sleepers everywhere, I had to change my studies. I entered his office to find him dressed in a vibrant lab coat, thinking at his desk, and ready for our review of yesterday. His eyes said he knew something. They started in the wizard stare before I even sat down. But he let me talk first, probably just to hang myself. Dr. Santos, I really need to talk about yesterday. He said nothing. This was awkward torture. I decided last night to switch my research focus for my PhD. Again, no response, no surprise. What had Sam done? I couldn't stand the non-response. I cocked my head, begging for a reaction. This doesn't surprise you? Dr. Santos held the pause in the room, crushing all life before replying. Seems a little rushed to me. Why are you switching now, John? He knew, but he'd make me squirm. Your thesis went so well. We already approved your next steps, he added. Then, before I could respond, the wizard struck instead. She broke up with you, too? It was over. I hadn't admitted to Lucius that we were in love with the same girl. The wizard read minds and actions, not voice. He had known it by the way we had both changed for better, and now for worse. He had seen it in our eyes when Samantha attended the defense. Deceit was futile. Yes, she ended it with me too, I replied frankly and with obvious guilt. She visited you? She sent a note. A lot of nonsense about controlling Ray. Water under the bridge now. My mind screamed in surprise at her audacity and his nonplussed response. That was never my intent, Dr. Santos, I promise. I was apparently already good at lying. I know, John. He had dropped it, like there was never an issue. I needed that skill. I would have to move on as well or draw unwanted attention. Anyway, you were right about us dating the same girl. In fact, it seems you are always right. But breaking up with her is for the best. Now I am free of any embroilment with Ray. Free to work on my thesis untethered. But I do need a change, in all aspects. I can't have people believing I have some ulterior motives. Dr. Santos respected honesty and directness. I may have broken his trust when denying my entanglement with Sam. I regained it with this honesty. Or half-honesty, at least. Knowing me to avoid gushy subjects, he moved on entirely. So, what is your proposed thesis topic, then? I want to switch to drug deliverance. I could almost hear his well-trained face contort. I knew he'd hate this recommendation. 
That's a big change from dream migration. Essentially a new science, countered Lucius with a tilted head. I want to be the best in the industry. That requires knowing all components, machinery, drugs, and dreams. I've known the machinery since I first cracked open the kit attached to my head as a child. My master's work has taught me the nature of dream duplication and sleep cycle alignment. It is time I learned the drugs. I know there are improvements yet to be discovered concerning the cocktail and how it reaches the right spots in the brain and what it does long term. You know that we study fundamental science here. We are not drug designers. We save that for the industry. I am in the industry of science and people, not patents. Sooner than later, I'll be working for Sleep Free. I will be the industry. In the meantime, I can make my research fundamental. Dr. Santos consented with a long sigh. I'll talk to the committee again. They'll be shocked given the quality of your defense, but I can convince them. Thank you, Dr. Santos. I'll get it done in time, though I'm going to need more sleep. It was part joke, part sheepish appeal for his continued help. He took it in stride, nodding in understanding. With that acceptance, I hurried out, anxious to avoid further discussion, and almost tripped on one of his many piles of books.